All right, now we're gonna move into chapter 19 where we're gonna start looking at the different components of the cardiovascular system. And we're gonna start here with the blood. So when we look at the cardiovascular system, guys, it's a combination of the blood, the heart, which is the pump, and the blood vessels that the blood travels through. So we're gonna actually see that we're gonna talk about blood in chapter 19, the heart in chapter 20, and the blood vessels in chapter 21. Now, hematology, guys, is the study of blood. Um, it's also the study of the blood-forming tissues. Um, we talk about with the bone marrow. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a little bit. And then disorders of these um, tissues and the blood itself. Now, guys, if you'll recall back from Chapter 4, that blood is a connective tissue. This connective tissue is composed of plasma. This is the only connective tissue that has a liquid matrix, which is the plasma, and form elements. Like you can see here in the picture, the formed elements are the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and platelets. All right, so before we actually start talking about each of the different um, structures independently, like the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, let's talk about what the function of blood is. Um, what is the blood there for? So the first function is that blood is going to transport things. Um, one of the most specific things it is going to transport is oxygen. It's going to transport oxygen from our lungs to our body cells. It's also going to transport nutrients, specifically glucose, but also proteins, um, or also amino acids, fatty acids, things like that, um, from our GI tract to our body cells. It's also going to transport hormones from our endocrine glands and tissues to their target cells, wherever they, that might be. Um, it also is going to help remove waste products from your body cells, um, like carbon dioxide. We drop oxygen off that we picked up from the lungs, but then we need to drop carbon dioxide off at the lungs so that you breathe it out. Um, also in your kidneys, the blood gets filtered um, for other, <clears throat> also in your kidneys, the blood gets filtered for other waste that gets collected at the tissues like urea, creatine, things like that. Waste products are also going to lead through wet glands like electrolytes. Um, the liver is also going to take care of some waste products such as bilirubin and so on. Um, your blood also is going to help with heat. When your body cells do metabolic processes, and <clears throat> when we see there's going to be a conversion of energy, whether it's going to be building something or tearing it apart, we see that sometimes there's those exothermic reactions where there's going to be heat that's given off. Um, the blood is actually going to help carry this heat, and it's going to help deliver it to the skin so that it can be released whenever you're hot. That's why a lot of times when you get really warm, you'll get flushed because more blood is shunted towards your skin to help um, radiate that heat off of you. We're also going to see that the second function of blood is that it's going to regulate things. It's going to regulate the pH of your body. This um, means that it's going to contain buffers. These buffers are going to help keep the pH of your blood between 7.35 and 7.45. If you will recall, 7 is neutral, so this is slightly basic because it's the higher side, but this is how blood wants to kind of stay in its range, and there's going to be buffers there that's going to help with that. We also see, again, it's going to regulate body temperature, whether the blood vessels do vasoconstriction, where we're going to pull blood away from the surface, or they do vasodilation in order to blood towards the surface like your skin to uh, release heat. Um, blood temperature, guys, is a little bit higher than your normal body temperature. A lot of times we talk about normal body temperature being 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. However, blood temperature is about 38 degrees Celsius, which is about 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's actually a little bit higher. Blood also regulates water content of your cells. This creates that osmotic pressure that's going to either push water in or pull water out. When we talked about um, in the cell chapters um, in Anatomy 1, the whole idea of a hypotonic solution versus a hypertonic solution, the blood's going to help with regulating this as well. The third and last thing that we see that the blood does function-wise is that it's going to help protect. Um, it's going to protect us in two ways. The first way is through coagulation. This is going to protect against blood loss. If a blood vessel ruptures or bursts or if it's um, cut or damaged due to trauma, we want to stop that bleeding. And coagulation with the use of platelets helps do that and that's going to help protect the body and keep the blood where it's supposed to be. Also, we see that white blood cells are going to be found in the blood, and they are going to protect against foreign invaders, not just in the blood, but also in the um, lymphatic system, which we'll talk about a little later in Chapter 22, where a lot of these white blood cells do migrate, but they do, um, they're also found in the blood. 
Now we're going to be looking at some terms and some different things that directly relate to blood before we move on again to talk about the formed elements. The first thing is that you may see abbreviations that are like TBV. TBV means total blood volume. We have between four to six liters of blood in our body um, at any given time and that's about eight percent of our body weight. Now males normally have a little bit more between five and six liters. A lot of times this is due to them having a larger body size um, than females. Females because the frame is normally sh uh, smaller and they're normally shorter it's four to five liters. Now there are exceptions where we have very tall females or very short males and this number can change but the average is between four to six liters of blood. Now total blood volume is regulated by a number of hormones. Um, the first being ADH, if you'll recall, this is anti-diuretic hormone, so it's going to help regulate that water content, which is gonna be added back to the blood. Also aldosterone, remember aldosterone is released by the adrenal glands. They talk to the kidneys and they tell the kidneys to hold on to salt, which then in turn makes the kidneys hold on to water. So when we look at ADH and aldosterone, this is to increase your total blood volume. <clears throat> On the other hand, we see there's A and P. That's, this is that atrial nidoretic peptide. This is the one that the atria of the heart releases. This is actually um, decrease the total blood volume to decrease blood pressure. So it's the opposite of ADH and aldosterone. All right, so when we look at blood, um, this chart kind of summarizes the components of blood. It is found in your textbook on page 663. When we're looking at the components of blood, one thing to note about blood is that it's a little more viscous than water, meaning it's thicker than water. Um, it also kind of has a sticky type structure to it. Um, when we look at blood as a whole, 92% of your body weight is gonna be through your other fluids and your tissues and only 8% comes from the blood. When we break the blood apart, 55% of it is the blood plasma, which is the liquid part. 91.5% um, of that is water. So most of the blood plasma is water. However, 7% um, are proteins. You have proteins like albumins, globulins, fibrogens, and others that um, may not be listed here, like um, certain hormones or things like that. These all play different roles depending on if they're an antibody, um, they're fibrogen, it could be help with blood clotting, different things. We also see other substances that are dissolved in this water as well besides proteins, and these are electrolytes, nutrients, gases like carbon dioxide and oxygen, um, regulatory substances, and even those waste products that we had talked about like urea or creatine. The formed elements, which are the actual cells that are present, make up 45% approximately of the blood. Um, if we break this down, we can see that platelets, you have between 150,000 to 400,000 platelets at any given time. With white blood cells, you have between 5,000 and 10,000. Now, these numbers can go up or down depending on some different issues or disorders or problems that a patient may have. And this is why blood tests a lot of times can give us a good indication of what's wrong with a patient um, if these numbers are not within these ranges. Um, when we look at white blood cells, though, guys, there's different types of white blood cells. We'll talk more about them. But if you look at the chart here, you have neutrophils, which is the largest group, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. So these are the different types of white blood cells. Then you also have your red blood cells. Your red blood cells, you have between 4.8 and 5.4 million red blood cells. And again, this is going to be based a lot of times, though, on how many liters of blood you have, whether you have closer to the 4 or the 6, okay, um, when we talk about the blood volume. So this chart is a really helpful chart to show you the breakdown of blood, and it is found on page 663. So let's break each of these um, components apart. So first let's look at the plasma. The plasma is the liquid portion of blood. It's approximately 55% of your total blood volume. The plasma is 91.5% water. Please remember that, that it is mostly water. Um, only 8.5% are going to be those solutes like the proteins, um, the electrolytes, things like that. Now, when we look at solutes, guys, most of them are going to be plasma proteins like albumin, globulins, fibrogen, different enzymes. Um, a lot of these are going to be synthesized in the liver. This is also why in blood tests, a lot of times they're looking at liver enzymes because they are found in the blood. Um, we also see immunoglobulins. These are antibodies. Antibodies are going to help fight off infections, and these are going to be created or synthesized by B lymphocytes. We'll talk again a little more about those when we get to the immune system chapter. 
Um, all plasma proteins are important in that whole idea of the blood, os blood osmotic pressure because the more solutes you have changes kind of that whole hypotonic, hypertonic, or isotonic type solution. So this is going to allow water to move either towards the cells or away from the cells depending on how many uh, proteins are located here in the blood. Um, other solutes we talked about are electrolytes. These can be ions like sodium, potassium, chlorine, um, bicarbonates, phosphates, and so on. We also see nutrients like glucose, hormones. Um, these are going to be some hormones that are mostly going to be proteins, but remember that those lipid-soluble proteins can also travel through the blood with a carrier molecule, which is a protein. Um, gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, and also waste products like urea, ammonia, creatine, uric acid, bilirubin, and so on. Now, when we look at the formed elements, so these are the cells. They are approximately 45% of the total blood volume. This is also known as the hematocrat. Um, the hematocrat is abbreviated as HCT. Um, hematocrat is a really good way to kind of test to see if the there is enough red blood cells specifically in the blood because that's, those are the ones you can actually see a little bit better. Um, however, it can help us know if there's going to be some potential issues with the blood. Um, when we look at this, erythrocytes is another name for red blood cells. Erythro means red, site means cell, so these are red blood cells. Another way to also um, discuss red blood cells is to abbreviate it as RBC. The next type of cell are the thrombocytes. Thrombocytes are uh, the name for platelets. Uh, platelets can also be abbreviated as PLT. We then have the leukocytes. Leukocytes are the white blood cells, um, and again, they can be abbreviated as WBC. When we look at this, though, remember that there are multiple types of white blood cells. There's neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes, so there's a lot of different types. Um, now, guys, one thing to note, though, is red blood cells actually outnumber white blood cells um, about 700 to 1. So you're going to have a lot more red blood cells than you are going to have white blood cells. And you can actually see that here in this picture. Guys, if I show you a picture like this on the exam, I would hope that you would be able to pick out if I point to a red blood cell and know what it is versus a white blood cell versus a platelet. And so it's important for you to be able to tell the difference in a picture of what a red blood cell looks like, a white blood cell, or a platelet. And this particular picture is found in your book on page 665. Now, guys, in the red here, I give you some kind of normal levels um, in of the blood for men versus women. Remember, men, because their body size is normally a little larger, they are going to have um, a little bit more of some of these components versus um, the females. I'm not going to ask you to memorize this because if you go into the medical field, when you get lab work, a lot of times they give you the the patient's numbers on one side and then they give you the range that it should be in, whether it's going to be then high or low based on that range. So you don't have to memorize these, but I do want you to kind of take a look at it. Um, if you look at red blood cells, when we see this, men should have between 4.2 and 5.4 million red blood cells. Uh, women or females should have around 3.6 to 5.0 uh, million. Um, when we look at HGB, that talks about hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a special protein that is in red blood cells that helps carry oxygen. Um, when we measure this um, in a small part of blood or a small sample of blood, we want to see in males that the range is between 14 and 18, whereas in females it's between 12 and 16. Um, hematocrat, hematocrat is the total blood volume that's of the formed elements and it's approximately 45 percent. In males we see that it can range between 40 and 54. In females it's 38 to 46. Now the hematocrat gives us a good idea like if somebody's anemic. Anemic means they don't have enough red blood cells and so if it's lower than that 40 or that 38 we can say that the patient is anemic. Now when we look at white blood cells and platelets, there's not a difference between males and females. With the white blood cells, we should have between 3.5 and 10.5 when we look at this. And this is in the thousands, so it's it would actually be like 3,500 um, to 10,500. We also see with the platelets, you have normally 150,000 versus uh, up to 400,000. All right, so these are just some of those values that you would look at if you take a blood sample to see if the ranges are within normal. All right, so the big thing we want to look at then is how do we make these blood cells? What if you need more red blood cells or you need more platelets or you need more white blood cells? How do they form? Um, this process is called hematopoiesis. This is the formation of blood cells. Um, when we look at this, it's really important that 
when we see that red blood cells have a different job than white blood cells that has a different job than platelets, this means if they all come from the same line, then there has to be stem cells present. All right, so this is what we call the pluripotent um, hematopoietic stem cells. These are found in your red bone marrow. So guys, um, when we hear about like stem cell research, it doesn't always have to come just from embryos. Um, you have stem cells right now. They're just inside your bone marrow, which is a little harder to access. All right, um, but they're still there and they're still stem cells to um, do other purposes for red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. Now before birth, this myeloid tissue is actually going to be found in the yolk sac, the liver, the spleen, the thymus, and the lymph nodes. Um, they're going to help with the blood cell production. However, after birth, okay, after you're born, we see that there's a shift. These other structures like the liver, the spleen, the lymph nodes, they now have to have a different job because the baby's outside the mother's body. So the red bone marrow is the only place that actually still contains these stem cells to help with blood cell formation. And the guys, this is going to be the epiphysis of the long bones, so it's going to be kind of towards the end of the long bones, like your humerus and your femur. Um, your flat bones, like your sternum, your ribs, and your cranial bones, they're going to also have a lot of red bone marrow. Your vertebrae, your pelvic bones, and also lymphoid tissue is also involved in the production of certain white blood cells that we call lymphocytes. So when we look at the formation of blood cells, you can see up here at the top of this diagram that you have your stem cell. Depending on what's needed at the time, whether you need a red blood cell, a certain white blood cell, or a platelet, these stem cells are going to be um, triggered to become something else. And this is kind of like a flow chart. So if we look here, you have your uh, pluripotent stem cells. These can be turned into myeloid stem cells. When the myeloid stem cells um, get triggered by certain kinds of uh, colony forming factors or units. You see that we can um, have red blood cells um, that are formed over here. We can then have uh, platelets here and then you can have some of your white blood cells off of this myeloid stem cell track. On the other hand, these same stem cells at the very top, if they are triggered to create a different type of white blood cells, these are going to be called lymphoid stem cells, and they are going to make a different type of white blood cell. So this kind of is a flow chart to show you how these cells um, are made from one single stem cell, and then they become more specialized. This particular um, picture is found on page 666 in your book. So let's talk a little bit about some of the terms you saw on that chart. The first is the myeloid stem cells. These give rise to red blood cells, platelets, and all white blood cells except for lymphocytes. They differentiate into what we call progenitor cells. Um, these are known as blast cells. Anytime you see the word blast with a cell, it means that it's kind of a juvenile or young cell. Um, these are going to develop into those formed elements, whether it's red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets, but they're going through that transition and that process. Okay, that's what they mean by blast cells, a juvenile type cell. The lymphoid, the lymphoid stem cells get the lymphoid stem cells are going to give rise to lymphocytes. Um, there are two kind of main groups of lymphocytes. Um, we see that there's going to be the pre-B and the prothrombocytes, which develop into either B lymphocytes or T lymphocytes. Now the B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes are going to mature in different areas of the body, and this is what gives them kind of their name, and they do have different functions, which we'll discuss more in chapter 22. Now stem cells are able to dif differentiate into different types of blood cells, so they can actually um, get different types of jobs and become specialized. When we see that blast is on the end or on, um, describing a cell, this means it's the younger stage of the cell line, like kind of like the juvenile, the teenager. However, when it gets, when it changes to a site, like a erythrocyte, these are the more mature stages of each of the line. And so they actually then perform whatever job they were created to do. Now, stem cells are mitotic, meaning they can still do mitosis. There's a lot of cells in our body that can no longer do mitosis. However, when we look at stem cells, they still have this ability. They can replicate themselves. When each cell becomes nearly mature to that site stage, it actually is going to leave the bone marrow because the bone marrow, again, is where these tissues are located, these stem cells. Um, these mature cells are no longer mitotic, though. Once they leave the bone marrow, they're no longer stem cells because they are specialized. They have a special job, and so they cannot undergo mitosis anymore.
Now the lifespan of most blood cells is hours to days. They don't normally last very long. If they're not used, um, they're going to be recycled very quickly or they may be used very quickly. So they're very short lived for the most part. Now there are some exceptions, especially lymphocytes. Um, they can remain mitotic where they still can do mitosis, but they can also live for many years. These are gonna be a lot of times your memory cells that they're going to remember when you've been exposed to a, ter a certain type of virus or bacteria before so that if you get exposed to it again, it doesn't make you um, sick or not as sick as you were before the first time you were exposed to it. So, how does the bone marrow know what type of cell is needed? How does it know that it needs more red blood cells or white blood cells or platelets? Well, hormones are going to play a role here. So on this slide, I'll show you some different hormones. So the first one's erythropoietin. If you remember, erythro means red. So this is the hormone that's going to um, be produced by your kidneys. Um, your kidneys will have kind of all of your blood eventually runs through the kidneys and your kidneys kind of have one of those counters um, kind of like when you go through an amusement park and they had the old ones that you had to like turn and it counted how many people come through the amusement park or if you've gone to like a concert that somebody as you walk in they have that little clicker and they're clicking on how many people are coming in um, the kidneys kind of do this they keep track of how many red blood cells come through if the number of red blood cells is lower it's going to release erythropoietin to speed up your red blood cell production. This could be due to a fact that you've lost some blood due to trauma or to, let's say you donated blood. You donated blood, which means that they took some out of you and, and we need to replace that. And so erythropoietin would be um, released by the kidneys. On the other hand, if we're needing more platelets or what we call thrombocytes, this is where thrombopoietin comes in. It's a hormone which is gonna stimulate the production of platelets. Um, if we need more white blood cells, this is where we're going to release what we call cytokines. It's a local hormone. It's produced by the bone marrow itself. Um, it's going to cause the secretion of colony stimulating factors. These factors are going to stimulate what white blood cells are going to pre be produced. It's going to help decide whether or not you need neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, those types of things. Um, interleukins are also going to stimulate white blood cell production and activate those white blood cells to perform their function. So not only do they tell them to make whatever the particular white blood cell is, it is also going to help them know what their function is and what they need to do. All right, so now we're going to take a look at each of the formed elements, and we're going to start first with the red blood cells or the erythrocytes. Now, one thing to note about erythrocytes, they have a special shape, and this is called a biconcave shape. And so it almost looks like a donut with the middle not completely pushed out. Okay, so it's biconcave, meaning it's going to curve in on both sides, the top and the bottom. Now, the whole reason why it has this particular structure is that it increases the surface area of the cell, and this allows for better gas exchange. It allows them to be able to pick up oxygen and drop off carbon dioxide um, a lot easier and a lot quicker. Um, red blood cells also, they need to be very flexible. Uh, red blood cells are normally about size about seven to nine micrometers in size or diameter, but they actually have to pass through capillaries that are only three micrometers um, in diameter. So they're gonna have to kind of squeeze in there. Now, normally I don't think guys deal with this as much, but ladies, have you ever had, had a pair of pants that you were want, trying to fit into and they are a little bit too small? So you lay down on the bed and you use a hanger to pull up the, the um, the zipper, that sort of thing, and you're trying to squeeze yourself who's maybe like a size five into a size three or even one pair of pants, it doesn't always work. And so this structure though of the erythrocyte needs to be able to fit through these tight spaces. So you can kind of think of the erythrocyte more like an octopus. If you've ever seen an octopus, and you can Google this on like YouTube or something like that, where you see an octopus escape from a small structure, they don't have a lot of bones, they don't have a lot of structures that are hard inside their body, so they can squeeze through really small spaces. Your, your red blood cells can do this as well. And the reason they can do this is because they've actually lost most of their their organelles. They have no nucleus. They have no organelles and they have no um, way to do mitosis because remember mitosis is the splitting of the nucleus. All right. If there's no nucleus, then of course they can't do mitosis. Now red blood cells do contain a very special protein. This protein is called hemoglobin and we abbreviate it as HGB. When we look at hemoglobin, you have to know though that this hemoglobin has to be produced early before the nucleus gets kicked out. 
Once the nucleus is kicked out, we no longer have the instructions on this protein, which means we no longer can do transcription and translation. So all the hemoglobin has to be made early on before the red blood cell does its maturing. So let's take a quick look at hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein molecule. It is adapted and it has that special shape in order for it to carry oxygen. Um, when we look at each red blood cell, it contains about 280 million molecules of hemoglobin. So we have a lot of hemoglobin in each of our red blood cells. Now hemoglobin does consist of four globulin proteins, meaning that they're in that tertiary stage, okay, the, the third stage, and when they bind together and they're held together by iron, which we call the heme center, which you can see here kind of as these yellow discs, they're held together and this is what creates that 4D shape or what we call the quaternary stage, which is stage four. That gives it its shape so that it can carry oxygen properly. Now when we look at hemoglobin levels in a normal adult male, the level should be between 14 and 18 grams per deciliter of blood. Um, in females, it's normally a little less, 12 to 16 grams per deciliter. So let's now talk, we looked at that, kind of what the anatomy of the red blood cell looks like. Now let's talk about its function. Now, when we look at the function of the red blood cell, it does really revolve around that hemoglobin, that special protein that's found inside of it. So hemoglobin inside the red blood cells are going to pick up oxygen at the lungs. So once they reach the lungs, they're going to pick up oxygen. This changes that hemoglobin into what we call oxyhemoglobin. The hemoglobin is then going to travel through the blood so that it can release oxygen to our tissues. If you'll recall, oxygen is super important for us to do cellular respiration and for our mitochondria to help us to take that glucose that we have and create ATP. Now, how does it get into the cells on and off of the hemoglobin? It's going to diffuse out of the plasma into the interstitial fluid, the fluid around each cell. Then it's going to diffuse actually through the cell membrane into the cell. Now hemoglobin, once it drops off its oxygen, it actually has the ability to bind or pick up carbon dioxide. So it's kind of like a taxi cab or a bus route where it's to drop some individuals off like the oxygen and it's gonna pick the carbon dioxide up from the tissues, which is a waste product. The hemoglobin then gets released. The hemoglobin then travels back to the lungs where it's going to release the carbon dioxide so that you can breathe out and then it will pick up more oxygen and start this process over again. Now hemoglobin doesn't just carry the oxygen and the carbon dioxide, it also has functions in helping you regulate your blood pressure. Um, the reason it can do this is that it has a gaseous hormone called nit nitric oxide or NO, which can bind to the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin can release this um, nitric oxide or NO whenever it needs to. This hormone is going to be a localized hormone. Once it's released, it causes vasodilation, so it causes the blood vessels in that area to get bigger, which improves the blood flow. When we can improve blood flow, that means we can also enhance oxygen delivery to that particular area of the body. When we look at the life cycle of red blood cell, red blood cells live to be, um, they live about 120 days. Production of red blood cells is called erythropoiesis. This is where erythropoietin, the hormone we talked about earlier, is produced when the kidney receptors detect hypoxia. Hypoxia means a decreased amount of oxygen. Well, remember, red blood cells are the ones carrying the oxygen, so if there's not enough of them, we're going to detect that there's not enough oxygen. Um, so let's look at the stages of erythrocyte development. How do we create an erythrocyte once we know we need them? Okay, this is taken from that big picture um, that we looked at earlier. It's just the red blood cell side. Um, but if we take a look at this, you can see that you have the stem cell, okay, the point, point stem cell, which turns into the myeloid stem cell. It's then going to be influenced by a, a certain kind of colony factor. This is going to then cause it to be what we call a pro-erythroblast. Pro means like beginning, and if you remember erythro is red, blast means that it's an immature cell. This is going to then develop into what we call a reticulocyte, and the reticulocyte will eventually become a functional red blood cell. Now, one thing to note about the reticulocyte is these are known as erythroblasts, and, but they already have lost their nucleus. If you notice in the picture, they've already ejected the nucleus and got it out of there. 
they now will have their biconcave shape. Now our reticulocytes then are going to leave the bone marrow. When they leave the bone marrow, they're going to finish doing their maturing out in the blood. This takes about one to two days. It's kind of like on the job training. They're going out there and they're looking at how the older red blood cells carry the oxygen, pick up the carbon dioxide and so on. And so they go through a training session, but it only lasts for about one to two days. Your reticulocyte count within your blood should be between 0.5 and 1.5% of your red blood cells. We don't want too many of them. It's kind of like if you're trying to train, um, if you were like in a restaurant and you're trying to train four people at once, that's going to be a whole lot harder than trying to train one person or even two. And so that's what kind of happens here. We put those reticulocytes out there, but we don't want such a large number that our body gets overwhelmed with these red blood cells who don't really know what kind of job to do yet, what their job is yet. This brings us to our test that we looked at the hematocrat. The hematocrat is the percentage of red blood cells in your whole blood, okay, meaning that we take the blood out but we haven't done anything with it. Um, if your hematocrat is low, you are normally considered anemic. So if you have anemia, this is less than the normal amount of hemoglobin or red blood cells and your hematocrat can help detect this. On the other hand, we have what we call polycythemia. This is where you actually have a greater number or amount of hemoglobin and red blood cells. So you actually have a lot higher amount than normal when we look at polycythemia. All right, so when each red blood cell starts to get worn out, because remember we talked about that they live for about 120 days, it gets what we call phagocytized. This means it's going to get eaten up and recycled for its parts. It gets this happens with what we call macrophages. Now these macrophages are normally going to be found in the spleen. However, you can live without a spleen and if you don't have a spleen, this does not mean the process stops. It just means that the liver has to pick up the slack okay? because the liver can also break apart and, and um, the liver can also break apart worn out red blood cells. Now hemoglobin inside the red blood cells are going to get recycled. We want to recycle as many of the parts as possible. Hemoglobin can get split into three parts. The first part's the globulin part. This is the protein portion. This is the amino acids that can get reused. So they break them off for the amino acids so they can reuse them. We also see that there's going to be iron. And remember um, from periodic table, Fe stands for iron. This is going to be carried by transferrin to the liver. So it's going to be kind of escorted to the liver, the muscles, or your bone marrow. And it's going to be kind of altered and changed. It's going to be stored as what we call ferritin or hemo, um, hemo does hemodesterin. These two forms are going to be less toxic than just your normal iron in your blood. Now, heme, on the other hand, is going to get, get, for, get converted into bilirubin. Bilirubin is a yellow pigment. Um, it's carried um, to the liver. The whole point of it going to the liver is that it hopefully will be excreted with the bile through the intestines, okay, so that it will leave through the intestines. Um, other um, forms of the heme may leave through the kidneys. Um, this is going to be what we call urobilogen. This is going to what, be what causes your urine to be more yellow. Whereas sternocolon, this is where you're going to see that when the heme gets um, added into the feces, it makes it more brown. Okay, so this is going to be the lifespan of the red blood cell. Now, in your book, you do have a good picture of the life cycle of the red blood cell. It is found on page it is found on page 669 in your book. So if you start over here at number one, you can see that the red blood cells um, death. So we're starting when they get worn out. After the 120 days, they're worn out. We are going to go through the process of recycling them. So this happens normally in the spleen. However, it can also happen in the liver. These red blood cells are going to be broken into their pieces. You can see you have the globulin. The globulins are going to be broken into amino acids, so those amino acids can be reused during protein synthesis. If you look at number two, then you can see that heme is going to then go through the process of being converted into the, uh, the into iron, which is going to be carried by transferrin towards the liver, where it's going to be stored as ferritin. And then we also see what we call the bilirubin. This is going to um, ultimately end up in the liver being processed and added to the small intestines or the kidneys to be given off as waste. Okay, so this is just a flow chart to kind of show you the life cycle of a red blood cell. This is what happens after it's 120 days and, um, that it's lived. 
Okay, so on our next presentation, we're going to continue talking about blood and we'll focus more on the white blood cells and the platelets as well as some of the um, different kinds of diseases that come with um, an abnormality with red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. Um, again, if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know.